This is a follow-up now on the integration of God's decisions. I don't know if it hit you, but it hit me pretty hard. This whole thing from the get-go, ever since episode one of the God Deed series, you know, where I started it all out in episode one with God essentially is decreeing that truth be free, and then Romans 8.28, basically, he's going to turn even the lemons free into lemonade. In other words, let the lemons exist, let them be free to be what they are, and I, God, for my own sake, that's in the Greek of Romans 8.28, for my own sake, I'm going to make good on it. Now, you know, people aren't spending enough time on that because really you can't see in the English that that's what Romans 8.28 says. You have to know the grammar rules of the Greek to see how cute it is that Paul words it like this. Okay? We all have heard the the verse and we've said a thousand times, God works everything together for good. Okay, but that's not really the way the verse is written. It's bigger than that. What Paul does in the Greek is he puts the word himself first. In the Greek, it's in what's called the heroic accusative case, meaning object. And then the verb, the Greek verb there is sunerge, which comes from Greek vocabulary form sunergeo. And sun means together, and ergeo means to work or to, to make function. So sun ergeo means to work everything together. Everything is not actually specified as an object, because sun ergeo is an intransitive verb, and intransitive verbs don't take objects. Like when you say, I am, we're waiting for you to say, I am what? And just the word, I am, is incomplete. Because I am, to be, is an intransitive verb. It doesn't take an object. But it needs one, clearly. Okay, so what Paul is doing is he's playing on the knowledge of Greek in his own readers. He's expecting them to know this rule, that sunergeo doesn't take an object. So he puts God in the accusative case, in front of the verb. Not in back of it, in front of it. It should go in back. I mean, in Greek, technically, you don't have to do that. But when you put it in the place where it's not expected, it gives emphasis to what's out of place. Here, out of place is the word him. So literally, in Greek, it says him, he works everything, he works together. That's literally what it says in Greek. Him, he works together. Huh? See, that as a Greek reader, you'd be reading that and going, huh? All right? So, the astonishing thing about this is, and, and you have to look at the other verses in the Bible to realize just how much this is really what God's talking about. The astonishing thing about this is that he wants everything to be free and then he wants to unite everything in himself. Now this isn't an unknown concept in theology, but they aren't spending enough time paying attention to just how much of a difference this makes in understanding God's plan and him personally. Okay, but you can find it all over the Bible, even in translation. Isaiah 55 is a good chapter for it. Isaiah 54 is a great chapter for it. I I live on Isaiah 54, 1. God wants to make the sterile bear kids. Because Jesus Christ died, technically speaking, sterile. No wife, no kids, no progeny. That's Isaiah 53, 8. And so he's got, God's going to make all of salvation, all of the progeny, come out of him paying for sins on the cross, which, of course, we are. We're actually created twice by God. The first time physically, when our soul is imputed to our body at birth. And then that's Genesis 2, 7. And then the second pattern is, you know, the new birth. 
or your body already exists, your soul already exists, but you're going to hell if you don't believe in Christ. Well, now you believe in Christ, so now you get a human spirit, so you're now trichotomous, three parts. And with that human spirit, you can learn God. It's a new type of life because it's God's own life. That's what John 3.16 tells you. It's eternal life, not merely, you know, everlasting life. Eternal life has no beginning. So you are literally put into him. And of course, you know, the words in him are all over the New Testament. It's not just juridical on the cross being in him, which is 1 John 1, 7, in other places too. But it's being in him, living in him. Your life is in him. You are put in him, literally and figuratively and juridically in every other way. Doesn't mean you know it, doesn't mean you feel it, doesn't mean you can, you know, prove it. I mean, eventually you can prove it, but you have to know Bible before you can do that. Bible gives you a whole new way of seeing the same data and realizing, oh yeah, this all fits together. This is really God. And that's Romans 8, 28. That's the integration he's talking about. That's his decision. He doesn't want anything that can exist to be stopped. That's a pretty heavy thing to say. Everything bad, everything good should be allowed to exist as long as it can exist on its own. And of course, God had to design the existence of everything. But once it exists, it's got its own life. He doesn't gerrymander it. But it's still going to reflect him because he's the one who gave it the life in the first place. Your life reflects him whether you mean it to or not. And yet you're totally free to do or be whatever you want. Any restrictions that are on you are restrictions that are due to, you know, your, your own nature. I mean, you can dance or you can't. And if you can't, you can maybe learn how. And how well you can learn how versus someone else, well, it's a mixture of the chromosomes mixed with your head. How badly do you want to learn? Somebody who doesn't want to learn much, even if they're more capable of dancing than you, you might dance better than them because you want to learn more. So whatever your handicaps are, your volition can make up for a lot of that. But, you know, there's a certain limitation in each one of us. For some people, it's harder to draw than others. For some people, it's harder to drive or to tinker with mechanical things. For some people, learning computers is easier than others. And some of that is due to genetic makeup that is freely determined to morph in whatever way it wants. And some of it is volition. In fact, most of it is volition. You can be born with a high IQ, but if you don't use your volition, you'll be dumber than somebody with a 60 IQ who uses his volition. In fact, that's one of the big problems we have in this society. So a whole lot of smart people are not using their brains. You have to be deaf, dumb, and blind. Or a liar. To claim that Windows 10 is a good thing. They should just fire everybody who developed it. It's wrong on so many levels, I can't even begin to tell you. And yet it was, you know, occupied so much of the company's resources, and they can't even give it away for free now. So much so that they're pushing it onto your desktop without your permission. And I just did a video in YouTube and Vimeo showing that there is a way that they, they gave us a way back in June but didn't publish it until September 17th. How to keep Windows 10 off your desktop. Well, where were the brains in Microsoft? Anywhere in Microsoft. At the top, in the board of directors, in the CEO, in any of those people at the top brass who are getting paid millions of dollars a year. Where did their brains go? That they could be so dumb to authorize a product like that. So you see, being smart with a high IQ doesn't mean a thing. 
So that's the next thing God likes to integrate, is all these abilities that you might have, or all the abilities that something you own might have, it has to be free to not work. Okay, but if it's not working, if it's bad, if it's stupid, isn't that first a sin against God himself? You bet. So what does that tell you about him? in his decisions. I will allow everything that goes against all of what's true and right and good because it should first be free to be what it wants to be out of its own nature. And in the human, of course, we decide what our natures are. Things that aren't human don't have free will. And yet even they have a limited amount a volition. You know, a cockroach can choose to walk forward or stay still. And plants, plants don't have any volition at all. Yet they respond to good treatment. You see the point? God wants it all to be there. I argue with him about this all the time, especially lately. You know, when I was younger, I didn't have any standards, and so it was kind of like, oh, okay. But now I have really stringent standards, and I'm like, why do you let this go on? And of course, a lot of atheists will argue the same thing. They'll tell you they don't believe in God primarily because if God exists and he lets this garbage happen, then what kind of God is he? Well, I'm trying to explain that. I'm not saying you're going to like the answer. I'm not sure I like the answer. God says, hi, first, righteousness is freedom. That's his decree, obviously. Because look, everything that exists does not measure up to his standards. And yet he ensures its existence and freedom to keep on going against his standards. And that's why hell lasts forever. There are two big reasons why hell lasts forever. First, so that you can really be free to completely change your mind at any point. You don't believe in Christ ever once in your lifetime, you go to hell. That's true. Hell ends up becoming what's called the lake of fire. Right now it's in the heart of the earth. After the, you know, this current universe gets blown up and a new one starts, which is what, Revelation 21 or 22, then you get to have your own home alone in a place called the lake of fire. But you always have the right to say, you know what, I'm wrong. I want to go to heaven instead. I believe in Jesus Christ saving me from my sins, paying for my sins. Bing, you're out. You're no longer in hell or the lake of fire, wherever you are at the time you think that. Then you go to heaven. Period. Because he paid for all sins. So you're funded. Whether you believe in Christ or not. So God never got cheated. This is something the poor Calvinists will never understand. They don't understand. Because they insist on Christ only being able to pay for those who are saved. No. God deserves to be paid doesn't matter whether we get saved or not. He deserves to be paid. He got paid. Okay, so now that he got paid, that's your first reason hell lasts forever. He got paid. You don't believe. Okay, fine. You're in hell or in the lake of fire, and it's not pleasant. But you can always change your mind. That's the first reason. Second reason hell has to last forever is it has to be free to keep going on. It has to be free. It has to be free to exist. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the freedom to go there. Now, you know, why would anybody in his right mind want to be free to go to hell? But there are a whole bunch of people who want that. They're still there now. Hell is populated. How come everybody doesn't just say, Oh, golly, this is not a pleasant place for me to be. I think I'm going to believe that Jesus Christ paid for my sins. And why don't they do that and get out? Why isn't hell empty now? Well, if you want to know, go read the last half of Luke 16. The guy there in the last half of Luke 16 is sitting in hell. 
At that time, Jesus Christ hadn't arisen from the dead because he hadn't died yet. He was talking, telling the story in Luke 16 of a guy who was really there, really looking at Abraham, who was really at that point had not resurrected with Christ. At that point was sitting in the, across the ravine in the heavenly compartment that was called paradise in those days. And the guy that was sitting across from him, sweating his brains out, was all ticked off that he wasn't over there. And so he tries to get Abraham to feel sorry for him. And plays this little game. Go read, go read his game. Oh, Abraham, if you could just send Lazarus over here to give me a drop of water from the tip of his finger. Oh, really? Abraham has the power of God to send Lazarus across the ravine. I don't think so. It's an underground ravine, okay. The one thing the Quran gets right is its description of hell. Okay, so Abraham didn't send him over. Abraham said what? Well, no, I can't do that. Yeah, of course he can't do that. He's not God. So how come the guy who's kvetching over in the lake, you know, the compartment called Torments, how come he's not waking up and saying, gee, if I just believe Jesus Christ paid for my sins, I can go over to where Abraham is. Well, but he won't do that. He's self-righteous. Oh, see how I'm suffering. As if it wasn't his own fault. And even if it weren't his own fault, there's a way out and he won't take it. So it becomes his own fault. He is free to stay right where he is and suffer. Free. Now, God doesn't want that. God doesn't want that guy to be suffering. And you know what? As you can read in the last half of Luke 16, that guy's not only suffering, he's sinning. He keeps on shaking his fist at God. Of course, Abraham's long gone. Abraham and everybody else went up with the Lord when the Lord, um, you know, at his first advent, I mean, second, his first resurrection, which is, uh, what is it, Dad? Ephesians 4, 8, and 9. Okay? Yeah. Ephesians 4, 8. Okay, so our boy is looking at black empty space now, just like the Quran says. In paradise, there is shade. That's a refrain in the Quran. Yeah, it's dark now. Because all the believers left. And only the unbelievers live there. And if you believe in the Quran, you're with them. Seeing that paradise has shade. Yeah. <laughs> if you believe in Islam, you really have mental problems. Because the Bible, the Quran flat tells you that it's from Satan, but that's beside the point. Okay, back to the point. Why does God let that exist? Why does he let the Quran exist? Why does he let Islam exist? Why does he let people shaking their fists at him in hell exist? Because he wants them to be free to do so. Now, my big question to him continues to be, Okay, I get that, God. First, righteousness is freedom. I get that. And then, of course, the, the corollary righteousness that goes with it is that if he's God, he should allow everything to be free to go against him. And he should ensure, because he's God, he should ensure the freedom of everything to keep on being against him for as long as it wants. Okay, and didn't we all at some point in our life, didn't we want to be against God? How many times a day do you sin? You probably don't even remember. I have to use 1 John 1 9 every time I think about it because I don't remember. Okay, so when we're sinning, we're against God. Before we first believed that Christ paid for our sins, we were against God. So, he allows it. He keeps on allowing it. Okay, I get that. And he keeps on ensuring my ability to go against him. I get that. 
But then the next question is how? How, God, do you integrate and make working everything together for good all this fakakta nonsense that's going against you, including what I do? And of course, he just threw that answer. <laughs> I hath not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. And that's later on in uh, Romans 8, if I recall. It's uh, definitely in Philippians, what was it? Philippians 3.20 or thereabouts. Also, what was it? Ephesians 3.20. Well, of course, that's, that's not exactly what that verse says, but it's the same idea as applicable to the whole church age. Okay. Way above more than we could ever ask or imagine. Okay, well, that's true because I cannot imagine. I'm asking, but I can't imagine. How can he make good on? And I mean, it doesn't have to be something, you know, gross or big like the Holocaust. It can be something, and in many ways that's worse, something small like, well, I have to pee and you got to watch. How can that be enjoyable for you? What are you getting for that? Not a thing. I don't get anything for it. I get to feel good at the end when it's over. What do you get? God doesn't get anything for that. But he invented pee before sin came into the world. So a whole lot of really menial things that is that constitutes life. And it's like, what are you getting for this? How do you make good on this? It's unfa it's totally unfathomable to me. Okay. Every single day that you exist, God's integrating everything in your life for your benefit everything for everybody else's benefit because that's his benefit how what what can it possibly be I mean I don't know I mean I can talk about specifics things bad that happened to me that now I'm really glad they happened and I can say what the benefit is to me I still don't know what's the benefit to him it's really important to focus on that during your day is a sort of like Bible class to have out of the stuff that you do. Hi, I'm going through this stupid thing. I'm making a salad or writing an email or taking a shower. What, what's that doing for you, Dad? And I'm not saying you're going to know the answer. Just keep asking the question because that develops your ability to reason out the issue behind Romans 8.20 instead of the chirpy, churchy people going, oh God's going to work everything together for God. Well, actually, no, he won't, not necessarily for you, but definitely for himself. Because working it out for your benefit is something that you're going to have to want. If you don't want it, you have to be free not to get it. See, he's working, look at all those people who are in hell. They didn't be saved yesterday. All they have to do is believe that Christ paid for their sins. Believe in that payment. They're done. They're out. But they don't believe. So it's not working for their benefit, but what happened to them is for our benefit and especially for His. It could be for their benefit. My pastor would speculate about that for a long time. He kept talking about something he called the salvation escrow. He didn't he didn't focus on it long enough to really try to back it up, but it's logical. If God's doing something there for his benefit, and you're part of him, then what does it for you is going to do it for him. Because he invented you. Obviously, he did that for his benefit. How does it benefit God? I don't know. Why should I exist? I have no idea. Honest to God, I can't tell you. I see no justification for my existence whatsoever. I'm gradually finding out what he's doing with my existence. But I still can't tell you that I ought to be here. 
I really, I can't, I can't, couldn't come up with one thing to tell you why I ought to exist or that there's even a single reason why anybody should ever pay attention to me. I don't even want to pay attention to me. But I get to be here to see him. And that, of course, is what David concluded at, what was it? 139.17. Psalm 139.17. How precious are your thoughts, O God. So the purpose of my existence is in the enjoyment of it and the justification for it is so I can see him. Otherwise, I don't see a reason for me to be here. So that kind of stuff's going to matter to you at certain times in your life. Well, here's what you can do with it. God decided for you to exist. Therefore, every little thing in your life, he has to want it to be there or it can't be there. Why does he want it? And not only does he want it, but he claims proleptic position, heroic accusative of Altos. For his benefit, everything works together. Romans 8, 28. Go look it up. And now, at some point in your life, you're going to be front and center with it too. God, what are you getting for this? It is going to be really important at some point in your life to know that the basic idea is that he's integrating everything into himself. And of course, that's covered, and I've said it a thousand times, in Isaiah 54, Isaiah 55, what was it? Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, Ephesians, what was it? 3, 3 15 through 19, um, actually a whole ton of other verses, but I, my brain is going out. Think about it. Talk to him. He'll tell you the verses I forgot. Bye.